What's up, everybody? Good morning. <laughs> Welcome back to Daily Time with God. Glad you guys are here. Uh, it looks like maybe we're having some hard time with notes. I wonder if I like somehow. Oh, it looks like that link didn't. Uh, for some reason, that link got broken in my post this morning. So I'm going to oh, post no. fresh link in the comments so you can use that link that I just posted and that one should definitely work. It just came from the Google doc. So, and I see some of you getting into it. So I think we're, <laughs> I think we're good. Back hey, on track. Uh, if you have never joined us before, um, we spend time together every morning like this uh, in an interactive Bible study format uh, in hopes of not um, replacing your daily time with God, but really supplementing and helping you to create a rhythm where this can be true in your own life. Uh, we study different books of the Bible and different uh, studies. We are finishing. <clears throat> we are finishing this week our study in Ephesians, which is parallel uh, study we've been doing on the weekends at Eastern Hills uh, called "Who Needs Church." Um, and so we've got just what three more days in this uh, in yep. this letter, which is awesome. Uh, and then next week we're going to do some kind of Bible study basics before we start a new series the following week. So we'll do kind of a specific one week study on some stuff that you've seen us do, uh, but maybe it's been difficult to replicate in your own Bible study. We're going to break down kind of what we're doing and how we're doing it, take questions. So uh, I think it'll be good. I know, I know it's going to be good. Uh, <laughs> thanks, thanks to Lisa. We are going to do another giveaway next week. So, um, you know, just be on the lookout. Yeah. It'll be based on engagement and sharing and comment and all that stuff like, like it was last time. So uh, awesome. Well, I am asking the question this morning, Lisa, are you a, uh, morning person or a night person? I'm more of a morning person. Okay. Um, and so like, what, what does that yeah. Mean? So in, in my old life, that meant about four 30, I would get up around four 30 mm -hmm. in my new life. It looks more like five 30. Yeah. 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 That's good. That's good. I'm a morning person too. Same kind of deal. Like I get up right now about six. Uh, but like, especially when I would do early morning workouts, cause that was like kind of my life giving rhythm. But now like all that gear that I do that with, if I do it at home is in a place that's going to wake people up. So right. I can't do that super early in the morning. Um, right. and so, uh, yeah, but way more so than night. Like if, like we put our kids to bed at eight, if I could go to bed at eight, I would like that. <laughs> right. I'm just not. I'm just and mad. there are sometimes we do like we put the kids to bed at eight thirty, and we're already in our jammies and have our teeth brushed. Like we're ready for bed. I get it. I get it. <laughs> hey, uh, let's say good morning to some folks. Good morning, Crystal. Good to see you. Good morning, Samantha. Good to see you. Good morning, Bree. Happy birthday, Crystal. Crystal, is it your birthday today? <gasps> Happy, Happy birthday. birthday. That's awesome. I know so many people who have birthdays today. Same. Two of our staff and. One of our former staff, I text a former elder that I texted this morning. It's, you know, it's birthday day. Yep. Uh, good morning, Greg. Good morning, Leslie. Good morning, Linda. Uh, it is Crystal's birthday. Look at that. That's awesome. Uh, hopefully, Crystal, those notes working for you now. Good morning, Liz. Good to see you. Definitely more of an evening person. Mornings are hard. I could see that. Yep. I'm curious, like, because <laughs> Alyssa is a night person. And if she could, I think she'd stay up till like two in the morning and wake up at noon. So I'm just curious when you say, evening person, Liz, kind of what does that mean for you? Uh, Deb says evening and that means 11 ish. That's, that's good. That's good. Uh, Leslie, good morning. Good to see you. Dawn, good morning. Good morning. Leslie says an evening person bedtime, usually around 11. All mm -hmm. right. I, I mean, like when I hear night person, 11 still doesn't feel crazy late to me, but you know, but I mean like 11 is when I'm waking up, yeah. you know, on those nights. So <laughs> yeah. Go to bed at night, uh, wake up at 11, then just kind of hang out. Right. Yeah, that sounds terrible. Uh, good morning. <laughs> Evening for sure. Hard for me to even think of sleep before 10 or 11. I, oof. Good on you. Um, <laughs> good morning, Jeanette. Good morning, Leslie. Gloria says, I can be a morning person if I need to, but my body isn't ready to get up till 8 or 8.30 unless I smell coffee and bacon. <laughs> Ooh, that, I mean, that sounds awesome. That, that does sound awesome. That sounds awesome. <laughs> Good morning, Jennifer. Definitely a morning person. I struggle to sleep after the sun comes up. Same, same. Like if I don't even set an alarm, I will wake up pretty early still. So yep. uh, definitely evening coffee is the only reason. <laughs> you know, <laughs> is, that, is that supposed to be there are mornings? Is that what that I'm is? I'm sure, okay? yes. <laughs> uh, Peggy said, good morning, morning person after coffee hits me. So a chemically induced morning person. Uh, Samantha <laughs> says, uh, I'm a morning person up every morning before 6 a.m., 
quarantine seems seem to have seems to have changed that. I'm up at least uh, midnight every night and sleep in until eight thirty. Yeah, quarantine's changing us, man. Yeah. Uh, good morning, Lisa. Good morning, Jeanette. Says anytime before five a.m. is still nightmare. It is still nighttime, so too ridiculously early. Yeah, man. If I, like in my previous life, if I could get to bed by nine thirty and wake up at four thirty, that was like my sweet spot. Yeah, I love that. Liz says we have been eating dinner late, like eight some nights at our bed at your bedtime. Yeah, I couldn't do that. I. I could not do that. I'm I'm like an old person. Like yeah. I'm you know, working out kind of late afternoon after work stuff. And then it's like five and I'm like, all right, let's eat dinner. And then let's get these kids to, I mean, like I'm, yep. That's just. There was thing. a phase in our lives where Anthony would come home from work at four 30. It was when Isabella was really little. Our oldest one was really little. And he would call on his way home at four 30 and ask what was for dinner. Like he wanted it ready when he walked in the door at five. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> amazing good morning stacy good to see you sherry said i'm an evening person go to sleep between 11 30 and 12 30 man that seems late to me that's i mean but that's Alyssa for sure Liz says happy birthday to you crystal with some emoticons i'm more of a morning person lately i've been staying up late though last few nights has been about 12 a.m and wake up ready to go Oof. 12 a.m. would I would not wake up ready to go. So good for you. Usually to bed 11, 11 30, says Liz. Crystal says, I've learned to change. Uh, I, I learned in college my best creative or technical writing happens uh, between 10 and 2 a.m. LOL. Or, but most of being, but being, after being di diagnosed with MS, I've come to appreciate early, cooler mornings since I have a hard time doing activities in the afternoon. Also, fun fact, Phil, you baptized me on the stand. 2018. That's so cool, Crystal. Well, happy Thank baptism you. anniversary day. That's really fun. Remember when we could like be physically present with other people? That was nice to remember. That was nice. The good old uh, days. And I think, you know, I, I can't imagine what living with the effects of MS mean for your schedule and good for you continuing to look for ways to, um, you know, find times of the day that are best for you. I can't imagine. Uh, good morning, Dennis. Good to see you. Uh, good morning. Stacy says no way in bed at nine 30 and up at, uh, five 30 or six, uh, amp amp. Oh, I know these guys. What's up? Mr. Leadership and sermons morning person all the way up by 4. AM exercise coffee and then work. Let's go. That's good. I'm talking about that. That's good. All right. Well, we are going to, uh, dive into Ephesians six. We actually taught this passage this last weekend, but we kind of flew over it. It was this bigger kind of theme, um, about kind of what we see is not always what we should believe that there's some stuff that we can't see that we should believe. Uh, we'll talk about why that is, but this passage is the first time we've done this in the history of daily time with God. Uh, these 10 verses we're going to look at for two days. So we'll get kind of as far as we're going to get today and then we'll pick it up tomorrow, you're going to see why that's the case. And you're going to see why in a 25 minute weekend message, I didn't try to cover two hours of content. So that's, you know, good times, good times. All right. But before we dive in, would you mind praying for us, ma'am? Yep. Um, God, we just thank you once again uh, for this opportunity that we have to be together. God, we thank you that we have your word that we can study together and that we can um, read and learn from. God, I pray that as we read, you would help us to understand some passages that feel a little uh, foreign to us. We don't think about um, other other realms and other um things like this very often. And so God, I just pray that you would give us understanding, that you would give us wisdom and that you would help us to um, just figure out what it is that Paul was writing about and why he wrote it. Uh, God, we pray that you would be with each one of us today as we continue throughout our day in this very, very strange time, uh, that you would give us the strength that we need um, to make it through today and to um, really stand out for you today. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So if you are just joining us today, 10-second summary, Ephesians broken into two parts. First three chapters, theological, how do I think? Last three chapters, uh, kind of how do I live? Practical implications of that. Uh, over the course of the last few days, we've been studying uh, kind of this sequence from Paul of what does it look like 
uh, to take off this old self and to put on our new self in Jesus. And that's going to be interesting, even as we think about this today, like Paul's talking about kind of our wardrobe today, he's going to talk about our armor. Um, and then he kind of talks about what this new self looks like. And one of those key aspects is mutual submission. And then he really builds a whole lot of chapter five and then into the beginning of chapter six around what mutual submission looks like in all of these key relationships. What does mutual submission look like in our marriage? What does it look like with our kids? What does it even look like in their context? We talked about bond servants or slaves, not that Paul was condoning slavery, but that he was talking about how we could show up, whether we were the bond servants in that moment or we were masters in that moment. Um, and so then he, he really begins kind of this arc today, I think of being able to say like, and don't get fooled to think that this is just you know, human systems. And if you just kind of live right on the outside, everything will be okay. He's showing us kind of what we can't see. Mm -hmm. So uh, I will uh, read these verses. And Lisa, if you would just kind of highlight along the way or bold or whatnot, that'd be great. Yep. Paul says, uh, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in that evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance making supplication for all the saints and also for me that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. All right. So um, we can see, obviously this is, if you've been with us, Paul is, is really looking at this from a very different uh, vantage point than he has been looking at it. He talks about, hey, we're serving the Lord and it shouldn't be that when we work, we're working for people like he's he's trying to continue to point us back to Jesus. But it really is kind of these ideas around human systems and how does mutual submission show up in these human systems. Um, but he begins, interestingly, with this word, finally, in, ver or in verse 10 in chapter six, really focusing on the idea of what does it mean um, that he's kind of getting to this place? He's like, hey, I we're going to end you know, just in a couple days, just a few verses after these, um, Paul is saying like, I need to make sure you hear something like one of the things I want you to have kind of last in your mind is this really, really important idea that the spiritual battle that's being waged is significant, whether you realize it or not. And what, what I often say when I teach this, I said it this last weekend, we're in this battle, whether we're followers of Jesus or not. And some of us are feeling defeated. Some of us are feeling exhausted and it's because we're unarmed every day, you know? And so uh, he, he's trying to kind of emphasize that, but he starts out with this phrase, Lisa, I'd be curious to your thoughts on it. You bolded it here, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Why do you think Paul starts here? Yeah, well, I heard um, one of my friends say this recently. She said, I love how Paul starts with this idea of being before doing. He says, be strong in the Lord. And so it's remember who you are and whose you are. You are a child of God. Um, and so, and just this idea that our strength comes not from ourselves, but from God. And we've talked about how God has this infinite and endless strength, grace, mercy, whatever. Um, so we have access to this infinite strength that he wants to give us. Um, and that we are not left defenseless, that he has given us what we need for this battle that we have to fight. That's good. Yeah. And then we have to, uh, and I wrote another note. <laughs> we need to yeah. be fully dependent on God's strength. Uh, maybe I said it, but we just can't do this on our own. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it, our temptation is 
you know, and I've used this phrase before, uh, moralistic therapeutic deism, right? That like the idea of how we think about our connection to God is that somehow the faith construct is uh, that we somehow pursue God. And if we'll do that, then he'll make us feel good um, if we do good. And then he kind of will help when he can, but he's sort of like at a distance. The, the deistic um, metaphor is a clock. And so inside of deism, it's like God made the clock and then is like, okay, I'm going to walk away and the clock kind of works. And you hear people, even Christians will talk about it and be like, well, you know, God's not going to interfere here. Like God can't do what, you know, whatever. And uh, God is intricately involved with everything. And so I think sometimes that idea, that false thinking has us do our own strength. Cause we're like, God, you're busy today. I get it. You'd help if you could, but you got a lot of things going on. So I'll, I'll take care of this. You, you hang out up there and I'll let you know if I need you. And Paul's like, no, no, no. Like you actually can't do this. And so the more days you wake up thinking you can are the more days you're going to fail. Hey, Becky's here, by the way. She said, sorry, she's late. Early, early morning Zoom meeting. We're all living in Zoom. I get it. <laughs> I get it. Uh, and then um, in verse 11, he adds, he continues, right? We want God's strength on us. But then he says, put on the whole armor of God. Tell us about that. Yeah, well, I love this idea. You know, we talked about um, in chapter, where was it, where he says to put on a new self? Um, is that in five? Yeah, yeah whatever. You remember. Um, but when we're, this idea of we're putting on this new self, and we've described it as we're taking off our pajamas and we're putting on our clothes for the day. We have this choice of what we're going to do, and we're going to put on something new that's... Um, uh, clean and, and, and good for us. Um, and here he uses that same, and I don't know if it's in Greek the same, but it's put on this, this armor of God and it's not just pieces of it. It's not just pick up this part of it when you need it. It is put on this whole armor. And so, and he's going to go in and he's going to describe each part of it. Um, but really from head to toe, God has provided the essentials for what we need to have the defenses that we need for um, this this battle that Paul's going to start to describe. Absolutely, and and it is it is the same phrase, by the way, when Paul says here, "put on." The idea of putting on before, same kind of deal. And it is interesting to think through, like Paul's talked about all these kind of like internal aspects of what it means to follow God in the new self, the like external indicators to show that we are doing that, and then here it's almost like he's saying, "All right, here's the armor that you have to wear." given the conditions on the ground to protect that new self, you know? And I think that is uh, just a really important, uh, just an important progression for Paul to communicate and important for us to know, like, it's not that one is required, one is essential and one isn't. Like one actually makes the other endure. Uh, Gloria said, I was raised Catholic and went to Catholic mass, uh, school and mass every day. Wow. Yet it wasn't until four years ago uh, that I learned about the armor of God and that Satan has power, but God gives us power and authority changed everything for me. Yeah. I mean, I think this is one of those things that is so eye opening. It's all throughout scripture, but we just tend to kind of overlook it. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, I gave a, a book link up top here uh, called the screw tape letters by CS Lewis. Uh, it's a fictional book. Um, but C.S. Lewis, great author, and really what he does is he spends time kind of breaking down um, the individual ideas kind of within really a letter between uh, screw tape and like other essentially like demonic forces about his target. And so even like thinking about the strategies that he's using and the logic that's at play in the midst of it like that is the battle that is actually happening right now for each and every one of us and so we're kind of waking up and understanding that for each day i don't think there's anything that the enemy of our soul would love more than for us to just wake up every day thinking as a completely naturalistic mindset like oh this is fine you know like we got to deal with corona but like that's fine but like corona is not the only invisible enemy we face and long after corona is defeated uh, there is still this enemy out there of our soul. And, and there's this fine line of like, yes, victory has already been secured for all of eternity, but we live in a moment that so that God has an opportunity to win people back, he is allowing this continued evil force to exist in our world. 
All right. So, uh, and then, um, Wait, so he says there was a great yeah. Bible study on screw tube. I don't really? know if she's talking about the Bible study that she led or oh. that there's actually one out there available that you can well, study. There is actually a Bible study available on Amazon for yeah. screw tape letters. Yeah. I and and she, Debbie led it. I think she's probably talking about the one she led though. So I'm sure that's, she my, that's my yeah, guess. That's my yep. guess for sure. <laughs> uh, and then, and, and I think one of the interesting aspects here is, uh, it's not pieces and parts, right? Like if you, cause for Paul, he's looking like he's, he's sitting in a prison cell. <clears throat> he's looking at uh, these kind of, you know, Roman soldiers. He's looking at the kind of gear they wear. I also think uh, that Paul is tapping into um, some prophetic references back from the book of Isaiah. So if you look at some of those, I've listed them up above this list that we'll get to in a little bit. Um, but I think that like for Paul, who, who certainly had Isaiah familiar, most likely memorized, uh, he's, he's tapping into some of that phrasing as well. But if you know about going into battle, if you know, like, you're not going to go, well, like this time I don't need my shield, you know, <laughs> like uh, the helmet's pretty heavy. You're going like <laughs> everything that I need, I'm going to have suited up because yeah. I know that I'm going against a force that can get me. And so yeah. I think that when we identify some of these things, there are going to be some aspects of this armor that are easy for us that we do instinctively or intuitively. And then there are going to be some things for all of us that we don't necessarily do as much, think about as much or apply as much. And I think the opportunity today is to go like, okay, so how do I reincorporate this aspect of the armor of God into my life? And I think what's really interesting here too, is Paul is not describing an invasion battle. Right. You know, it really is. It's not like this, Anthony and I watch um, Band of Brothers every Memorial Day weekend. It's just a, a reminder for us of, of our country and, and how it was fought for and things like that. But it's, you know, there's so many battle scenes where it's this invasion. And, and, and that's not the, the battle that Paul's describing here. It's this kind of this constant, ongoing, always happening. It, it doesn't have a start and a stop. It's just always well, and it's this insurgency, right? It's not, it's not like the front is somewhere else. Like it's right here. It's right mm -hmm. now. It's in your home. It's at yeah. church. It's in your workplace. It's in your neighborhood. It's at school. Like it's everywhere. And so recognizing that I think is really, really important. Yep. Uh, Debbie said, stop it. And then <laughs> Gloria said, Deb is an amazing teacher. And I loved that study. See, Deb, I don't, we can't stop it. Your fans are Debbie here. Said, stop it. Like keep it coming. Yeah. Yeah. That's what she means. It's a bridge. <laughs> we get it. We get it. Uh, and then, and then Paul says that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. There's a couple things here, right? So as you, as you read that phrase, uh, what are you kind of thinking about what stands out to you? Well, I, I, I the, first of all, it's this image of, of we're standing, um, you know, we're not in a, in a place where we're on the ground, we're not sitting, we're not kneeling, um, you know, we are standing. And when someone is standing, it's this, it's this image of standing strong. Um, so there's that strength aspect to it. But then the schemes of the devil, um, Satan is described in different ways throughout uh, the Bible. One of them is that he is a liar and that he is the father of lies. And so we're going to see that play out here. Uh, one of the things I've heard too, is that the devil is clever um, but not creative. And so he is using the same tactics that he used in the Garden of Eden, however many thousands of years ago with Adam and Eve. Um, he is so clever and he finds new ways to do the same thing, to tell the same lies, to help to make us doubt um, that God really has our good at the heart of what he is doing and how he is working. I'm actually going to link something in here. It's called If I Were Your Enemy. Um, it's something Jenny Allen wrote a couple years ago when she uh, wrote a book called Nothing to Prove, but it really talks about um, Hey, if I were your enemy, I would do this. I would I would attack you in this way. And if that didn't work, I would do this. And if that didn't work, then I would make you doubt who you are. Um, and I've got it right here. I'll throw it in there. But it's such a great perspective of how clever and crafty Satan is that he's he doesn't have our good. Um, in fact, he hates us. And so his goal and his mission is to uh, hurt us. And so even though we think like maybe, maybe that's not the case, it is. Well, and I think, um, you know, there, there's some interesting stuff that when we kind of back away from this conversation and looking like looking at this specific experience, 
I think something that's so important to understand uh, is that I think it's Peter. He talks about how the angels, they actually look at God's relationship. Like this is the angels in heaven. They look at our relationship with God and it says they wonder. They're astonished by it. Because uh, if you think about it, angelic beings mm -hmm. live with God, but they weren't created in the image of God. Angelic beings live in some form of relationship with God, but they don't live in the kind of relationship with God that we do. And they they have conditional relationships. The, the reason that we know they're conditional is because Satan was an angel, right? And he's a fallen angel, took a third of them with him, right? So th we know that those relationships are conditional. The thing that's so crazy about humankind is that we screwed up a whole bunch of times. And because of Jesus, we have offered to us an unconditional relationship. Right. So we know angels are looking like, God, you're like crazy about these people. And it's kind of crazy. Like what's happening, you know? And then uh, the devil who was like, hey, I kind of want to be like you. Uh, I, I think it's like, well, if the angels are confused by it, Satan and his demons are infuriated by it, right? Because they're like, all we wanted was to be a little bit more like God. God. And not only was he, now he's wasting his time on these idiots, you know? And so I do think that there's this like kind of seething, right? With the language that Paul uses elsewhere is that he's seeking for those that he would devour. Right. He, if he can't, if he can't undermine our faith, he wants to just completely take us out. And so I think this kind of picture of unity and mystery and the body growing through love, the reason that Paul is spending some time on this is because those things are so easily undermined yep. when we forget that we do have an enemy. And he's about to talk about what the enemy isn't, right? So right. what I think is so important is to understand like there is a plan for you specifically, like whoever you are, whatever you're facing, there are demons, probably not the devil. He's a finite being. He's not God. He's not all powerful. He's not all knowing. To Lisa's point, I love that distinction, clever, not creative, um, but he has a hierarchy. Like it's a, you know, mid-level management scheme. It's a giant <laughs> pyramid scheme that's going to end in hell. And so um, like most of them do. And so uh, he, he looks at this and says, Hey, like I'm assigning this division. I'm assigning this area. I'm assigning, we don't know how many uh, demons there are, but there is a plan for how to get at you. They, they know what your weakness is. And so when we live every day, completely unaffected, uninformed, um, we find ourselves ready to be absolutely taken out. Yeah. Um, uh, a couple well, of just one more thing. Peter mm -hmm. describes uh, Satan like a roaring lion. And I was reading something about this this morning and it was talking about lions are actually looking for the the weakest of the weak. They're looking for the stragglers. They're looking for those that are alone and isolated. And so, I mean, this just goes into the whole um, kind of underlying theme that Paul has created throughout the book of Ephesians in unity and that there is a reason that we are meant to be together because right. when we're alone, we're, we're separated and we're more susceptible to attack. Absolutely. And I mean, it's exactly what Paul was watching right in front of him with the Roman legion that was probably protecting him. So, yep. Yep. um, uh, by the way, Stacy asked, is your study somewhere online? I'm guessing she's talking about Debbie's. I don't think it's been recorded. That book is available on Amazon. Maybe we'll get maybe we'll get Debbie to record her Bible study for uh, for Screw Tape Letters. I mean, I've heard it was amazing. So, uh, Bree said, "I just bought nothing to prove. I just can't wait to read." That's awesome. That's great. Uh, Deb said, "Yes, you can find it on Amazon. Your your teaching series is on Amazon, Deb, <laughs> on Netflix. <laughs> That's amazing. amazing. Way to go, uh, Lord, Deb. By the way, she loves this kind of stuff. So <laughs> if, you're, if you're feeling bad for Deb right now, don't feel bad." Uh, Gloria said, Pastor Phil, is it true that, uh, that Satan can only see day to day and not the future? So uh, I would say this, God has the ability, God exists, well, we've talked about this, God exists outside of time. And so he's looking at every point in time, your highest high, your lowest low, the end of the world, the very first day of the world. He's looking at all of that, not like, um, like you and I live it day to day. He's looking at it all like a timeline in front of him. And he exists in every moment of it simultaneously. So just let that blow your mind up. That does not function that same way for Satan. We have no evidence to believe that it does. Uh, now, Satan, he knows, like, he, he's seen the Bible, you know, like he knows the end. Uh, so he, so there is, I think, kind of this, you, you watch sometimes, like I watch this with our kids, even when they know there's like a bad outcome to what they're doing, at some point they get to this tantrum level where it's just like, how much damage can I do in the mean? Like, I know I'm in trouble. I know this isn't going to end well, but like, I'm just going to freak out for a while. And I think that's kind of what we see in this age with Satan. So he knows what's coming. Does he know tomorrow? No. One of the most freeing things for me as a young Christian to learn 
is that Satan doesn't know my thoughts. Yeah. And so um, like this idea of the private prayer life that I have in my own mind and heart with God, that's just me and him. Now, I also heard that he's a good guesser, you know, like if there's a demon that's uh, that's around or influencing or oppressing or whatever, uh, they're pretty good guesser. They can see what your priorities are. It's the same reason that your smartphone is advertising all the crap that you talked about 20 minutes ago. Uh, it, you know, like there are these things, but uh, it was really freeing to me to go like, oh, he's not inside my head, you know, and to know he's a finite, limited being. Uh, and then uh, Crystal said that her note in her NLT says to withstand evil attacks, we must depend on God's strength and use every piece of armor. Satan, a vicious fighter, checks for weak spots. He knows them all. Don't try to face him unarmed. And I would add what Lisa said. Don't try to face him alone, right? Because it doesn't matter how much armor you got, you are outnumbered. Buffy said, good grief. The cheekiness is strong this morning. You know, it's here's fun. the thing. Debbie will throw it right back to us very soon. It's a hundred percent. It's <laughs> not in the corner crying at her house right now. Uh, Dom said, uh, could share what the, the devil looks like uh, from the old Testament. Think it's Ezekiel. Yeah. I mean, I think that when we look throughout the old Testament, we see lots of different portrayals, um, not just of spiritual forces or of evil. We see that show up repeatedly. Oftentimes in the old Testament, you'll see it uh, look like witchcraft or you'll see it look like kind of divination is a word that kind of gets translated from the Hebrew. Um, but it's also, you also see in, even evidences of Jesus, even before he was born, they're called theophanies um, where you see the embodied God uh, showing up. So when, like one of the most famous stories of it is Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego uh, in the fiery furnace. And it's like, Hey, there's somebody else in there. Who was that? Well, like commentators think that was Jesus before he was yep. born. So um, and then, uh, we're going to, we're going to look here for just a second. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, why is this so important? Well, I think it's because we get so distracted by what is going on around us. And we look at the people around us as our enemies. So whether that's, you know, from a, we're seeing it right now with a lot of political stuff. Um, we've, we've seen it with uh, people who look like us, act like us, don't look like us, don't act like us, um, believe what we believe, don't believe what we don't believe, you know, or believe what we don't believe. Like we're always looking for an enemy to fight. And we are looking across the aisle here rather than a, like in these unseen places um, and, and so Paul is like, stop being distracted by what you see, start paying attention to what you can't see. Cause that's the actual battle that you need to be fighting. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think it, it is true in our, in our life right now, outrage culture, I think says, okay, so what's the next thing you should freak out about, you know? And so like, there is a thing all the time, like the thing right now is, are you wearing a mask or not? That's the, that's the current thing. Mm -hmm. Like you're either a mask wearer and you're freaking out at non-mask wearers or you're non-mask wearer and you're freaking out of mask wearers. And it's like, okay, I mean, let's have that conversation. Sounds great. But like that person is not actually your enemy. And I think when we make, I think, I think the devil is just sitting back laughing right. at the state of our world right now, looking at like those idiots are all fighting mm -hmm. themselves. Like they don't even realize that I'm here, you know? Well, and, and how much joy does he get to see uh, Christ's church fighting each other? On, yeah. on things that really don't matter in the end. He's like, oh, this is amazing. You know, I don't even have to do anything right now because you guys are so busy fighting each other on something. I can just kind of sit back and enjoy the show. Right, right, absolutely. Well, and, and so here's here's an interesting distinction too. Eileen says, morning, uh, well, Satan doesn't know our thoughts. Can't he also be in our head and put thoughts that are lies in our head? I would say he has the ability for sure to like whisper and influence negative thoughts to you, mm -hmm. but he's not in your head. Um, one of the things Dom is kind of talking about this Ezekiel text. He says uh, that the devil does not, he's not a dude with a red suit, tail and pitchfork. As a matter of fact, Paul says uh, that, that the evil forces, Satan and his uh, demons, they, they disguise themselves as warriors of light. Yeah. And so more often it's like, oh, this seems like a pretty good idea. This, like when you think about even the biggest cults that we have today, they were oftentimes, they started because an angel came to them and shared a different gospel. And Paul actually says, hey, uh, even if an angel comes to you and tells you a different gospel, let that one be a curse. You're like, did they not read that part? But anyway, um, so important to recognize <laughs> that we're not like looking for some seedy figure to avoid. Like there, 
This is oftentimes coming to us. And I think the hard part is sometimes it's coming to us by people who are friends, by people who know Jesus and are followers of Jesus that have allowed themselves to be influenced by the schemes of the devil. And so they're coming at you and this it just changes it, right? When somebody comes at you with gossip, when somebody comes at you with slander, when somebody is trying to grumble and like you just think you shouldn't do that. We think about all those texts in Ephesians 4 where Paul was talking about that. Here he's like, no, no, no. They, they are being influenced by their old self, which is evil, and by the devil. And so recognizing like, okay, so what does it mean for me to be my new self and to put on this armor? It means I need to be on guard in the midst of all of this. Uh, Buffy says, uh, ooh, like I don't know that better than anyone. 20 years of love from that amazing one. Talking about Deb, that's adorable. Look at that. Bree said, I remember watching the Shadrach, <laughs> the Shadrach and Benny on VeggieTales. All right, I'll take your word for it. I've never seen that. Uh, and then Jeanette says, Satan is the biggest mask wearer of all. Absolutely. Uh, always hiding, never revealing who he truly is or what he truly wants for you. Because, right, he's using sin. He's using temptation. He's using evil. Um, and it, it's it's what all temptation and sin is, right? It, it promises you something um, that it can never deliver. Yeah. And for a moment, you go, oh, there's there's some sort of dull, shallow satisfaction in this. And then there's instant regret and yeah. the real hard part is when our consciences become seared and it stops having regret and all of a sudden it becomes like we're chasing a high we're chasing some satisfaction that was for a moment the first time and it's not the first time anymore and how do we stand up in the midst of that? And that's what Paul is talking about. Well, and yeah. one of my favorite images, I mean, just trying to, cause I think even just this idea that there's this battle going on in an unseen realm that we're aware of, but not aware of, uh, one of the things that helped me with this was in um, Daniel 10. So Old Testament, <clears throat> Daniel 10, there's a part where he's been praying and uh, an angel comes to him and says, fear not. Um, from the first day that you started praying, like we've heard your prayers. I've been trying to get to you. I'm paraphrasing. I've been trying to get to you, but I got caught up in this fight with, with Michael, another uh, angel who's fighting on your behalf. So I'm sorry that I'm late, but just so you know, God hears your prayers and we're, and we're working on it. It's and like, yeah. for me, I'm like, that's so, that's so amazing to know that these angels that are, that are looking at God, like, what are you doing with the losers on the earth? Um, right. They're still fighting this fight for us in this unseen realm. And then God is like, Hey, but you're part of this battle too. And here's what you need to fight. Right. And we're going to see that in a second, that some of what Paul is talking about here is not just the not just evil forces, but to your point, like there's these angelic beings that are twice the size of the demonic force and they're battling as well. Yep. Uh, Becky said predators don't scare off, don't want to scare off their prey. And yet somewhere down deep down inside, people know there's a problem and it's dangerous. And I think that's true. Right. Like there is this there is this like really crazy thing where it's like when you watch, you know, you're watching like National Geographic on Disney Plus and you see like the the predator is stalking its prey little by little by little. And the thing that's crazy, right, is you want to yell through the TV because you're like, that thing is going to kill you. Like you should run right now. But they're completely unaware. And I think the thing that breaks my heart uh, it's a great metaphor. The thing that breaks my heart is I feel like many, many Christians, that's the way they live every single day. And so it's like, oh, well, they could just be easily taken out. They could their, their joy could be easily robbed today. Their focus could be easily redirected today. They could be easily taken on to a Facebook debate that just makes somebody else the enemy and forget that you know, I talked about it this this weekend that we want to look at the fruit. We want to look at what's happening on the outside, but every piece of fruit in our life, every piece of fruit that's good, every piece of fruit that's bad has a root. And that's what Paul is talking about. As we look at the rest of verse 12, he says, uh, this battle, it's not against flesh and blood. It's not against your in-laws. It's not against politicians. It's not against people on Facebook, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So uh, when we see this, obviously Paul is kind of breaking it down pretty uniquely. So we don't, we don't know, right? We, we're not given a commentary by Paul to say like, well, what did you mean here? Some commentators have, have said, hey, is he talking about like the different divisions within the spiritual realm that there's like, you know, the commander versus the sergeant versus the foot soldier, 
We don't know the answer, uh, but certainly there is an idea from Paul, like this is not just a, a bunch of shapeless figures all just kind of running in chaos. He's already said that there are schemes and that there is some sort of kind of uniqueness within that. So as you even hear the language that he uses here, Lisa, how are you thinking about this kind of new battle as he's revealing it to us? Well, I mean, it's just this, it's a reminder that, like you said earlier, the devil's not fighting alone. It's not like he's just a lone ranger taking people out. He has allies um, probably beyond what we can think or imagine. And so uh, for me, it goes back to that, um, be strong in the Lord, because man, we can't do this on our own. Absolutely. And, and I think, you know, especially this word to me that th the idea that there are rulers and authorities, right? Like that the devil has said like, okay, you get, you guys, you're in charge of Aurora, Colorado. That That's just terrifying, right? You're like, oh gosh, like that, that's nuts. And then it's like, all right, you guys, you're going to kind of roll up. You're going to be in charge of all of Colorado. You're going to do like, oh, you guys, you're in charge of, uh, you're going to be in charge of the United States and, and targeting government leaders. That group is doing very well right now, by the way. And so I think figuring out like, okay, so th there is this system that's in place that Paul is saying, you kind of can't wing it, guys. Like the enemy of your soul is not winging it. The savior of your soul is not winging it. And if you want to just be the little deer sipping from, you know, the, the pond in the middle between those two, it is going to go super, super bad for you, yeah. right? So I think that that is so incredible to be able to sit back and go, okay, so this is what's happening. And then he says that there are these, there are these cosmic powers that we're battling against, but he, he uses this phrase, right? He says, he, he's, he's using two different things. One, he says this present darkness. Why do you think he uses this phrase? Well, I'm not sure if it's right, but um, one of the things that I think about is this idea that the, the and the Bible has built this up throughout uh, the beginning, but this idea of the difference between darkness and light. And so this reminder that this is that darkness that, that we've been talking about. And darkness is the, the opposite of light. It is the absence of light. Um, and so this is that battle is, is in the darkness. Well, and I think for Paul, especially when we think about, he is going to kind of tether in some of this text from Isaiah throughout the the stuff we'll look at tomorrow. But when he talks about when it when the when it talks about darkness, and in Paul's mind, he's he's thinking about this as somebody that was raised Jewish, somebody who's really kind of first studies uh, in language, especially reading would have been Hebrew. Um, darkness really points to ignorance, and mm -hmm. light really points to knowledge, right? So you see yeah. this contrast, it's, we think about it as evil and good, and that's true, but that's far more of like a Greek understanding of darkness and light. Uh, for Paul within a Hebraic mind, things are not as divided as they are for us, but within darkness and light, you have this contrast between ignorance and uh, knowledge. And so I think there is some idea of like, hey, right now this is concealed. We're in, we're in an era of ignorance and we are like, <laughs> there's all this stuff happening. That's like, oh, I see this. I see this. I see this, but there's this stuff we don't see. And Paul's like, hey, we're living in a moment where people don't necessarily know. We're in a moment of ignorance. The only reason that the devil and his demons can even do what they're doing right now is because people don't know better. If this was visible, nobody would pick the demons. Like that would be crazy. Right. But because it's invisible, we're picking the fruit rather than looking deeper. And so I think that really for us to be able to understand two things, one, there is ignorance in our present age. And then two, the present age is not the forever age that there is going to be an end to this. We've talked about this, that church historians refer to the moment that we're in right now as the grace age or the church age in which God has extended uh, human history for the purpose that no one would perish, right? Like his hope, he's not willing. God's perfect will is that no one would perish, but that all would come to know him. That's, that's God's deepest desire. That's what he wants. And so every day on planet earth is grace from our God to us to say, hey, your neighbor needs to know Jesus. Your family member needs to know Jesus. Your coworker needs to know Jesus. Your classmate needs to know Jesus. And our opportunity is to grow closer in him as we prepare for eternity with him and to help people who are close to us and far from him know him, right? And how do we do that? Well, we we do good in our, in our communities. We care for people, even through stuff like For Aurora, um, because that's what it means to be people of the light in the period darkness. And that was a question I had. It, I mean, is there a callback to, you know, Jesus being the light and then us in turn being the light of the world? 
Or yeah, is it I mean, really I this there, ignorance yeah, knowledge? That when, when Jesus is referred to as the light of the world, right? We see lots of different, um, I, I would say, ex expressions of light, specifically when we uh, look at it like a, at a cosmological level. So when we look at this in um, John, who often uses that phrase where he talks about Jesus as the light of the world, certainly in his mind, he's thinking about it in terms of ignorance versus information and your ignorance versus knowledge. He's also thinking about it in this bigger picture of revelation. He's also thinking about it in this bigger picture of hope, right? Because that's the other thing that we see a lot in the New Testament in Greek is this idea that darkness is hopelessness and light brings hope, right? right, um, right. That light casts out darkness. Uh, Jennifer said, uh, it's amazing how easy it is to live uh, knowing something is wrong because it's familiar and change is hard. We can go a long time knowing deep down that something is off before a blow up forces painful changes. Big lesson, pay attention when something is off, God is speaking loudly. I agree a thousand, a thousand mm -hmm. percent. And I think that the devil and our old self would love us to think that that sin, that compromise, that little indulgence, whatever it is, that you can manage it, that you have it under control. Um, but the longer the longer we sit in it, I mean, the more convinced we might be that we have it under control, the less we do. Jeanette said, speaking of spiritual forces, would you guys join in battle and pray for my neighbor? Charlie uh, lives in a group home two doors down and has a mental health disorder. He has asked for prayer and has visions have and his, his visions have increased. He says they have me trapped. Uh, I've been talking with him almost every day. Oh gosh, yeah, absolutely praying for Charlie. That is that is awful. Uh, Crystal said that is my prayer for my family. Uh, taking Lisa and Anthony's class tonight. Hey, look at that. That's great. Uh, and then Vicky said, uh, why then are there chosen ones? Wouldn't he want uh, to choose everyone then for a better chance of bringing people to him? I'm sorry, I'm still working through this. This is the right question to ask, yeah. Vicki. It's exactly the right question to ask. If God's perfect will is, uh, he's not willing that any would perish, but that all will come to know him. Like I'm not coming up with that. That's in the Bible. Um, and then we read Ephesians 1. We're like, so how do those two fit together? And Paul's like, they fit together. You're like, wait a second. That's why I said, even when we we're studying Ephesians 1, there is a divine tension in this. Like if you talk to somebody that's like, oh, it's, it's all human responsibility. God's got nothing to do with it. I'm like, well, I don't think you're taking some of these passages maybe as, as seriously as you should. And then for folks that are like, oh, God doesn't give a rip about people that are unredeemed, people that are unrepentant, people that are not going to become, he just doesn't care. They're not in his elect. Uh, and then I'm like, well, but there are passages that seem like, unless I radically reinterpret them, he, he loves everybody and he wants everybody to know him. So right. this is exactly the right question. The tension you're feeling is entirely appropriate. And I cannot resolve it for you. I am very sorry. <laughs> I feel the same tension. I'm glad that there's a tension though, to be honest. I think if we could figure out the soteriological implications of how God saves people, we've probably limited God. So, All right. Uh, we are going to finish here at the end of verse 12. So uh, he says, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now at first read, when we think about the phrase heavenly places, places, we think about heaven, right? Mm -hmm. I'm assuming that Paul isn't talking about uh, the fact that there is uh, demons in heaven. What is he talking about here? Well, I mean, to me, I feel like it's those unseen places that we've just kind of been alluding to. Um, and it's so weird. I don't know. I, it's so weird to me to think like there might be something evil right here. Right. And yet at the same time, there's a part of me that's like, I know it's there because I can yeah. feel it. So um, when, I don't know if that sounds weird. I'm sorry if it does, but there is this unseen realm around us. And I think I mean, that's the only way I know how to describe it. There's just an unseen realm. It is not demons in heaven. It is um, demons all around. Right. And I mean, I think because of like comic book movies, we can use language like parallel universe, mm -hmm. you know, it makes a little bit more sense, but it, it's like, it, it, it's not, it's not somewhere else. Like it's, it's here. Right. It's, it's right now. And I think, um, sometimes what happens is we get into like weird mysticism and we like mix stupid stuff into this. So people are like, well, that's why I like going to church. Cause like demons can't go into God's house. And then it's like, well, <laughs> building actually isn't God's house. Right. Y you are. So, 
Uh, there's lots of conversation about what could a demon do in the life of someone that also has the Holy Spirit in them. Um, definitely can influence you and me. I don't think that it can um, possess us, but I think being able to like take a step back and go, okay, so like if everywhere I go today, there's good forces and evil forces all around me. And here's the crazy part. They are battling each other for you. Right. Like that's mind blowing. Like, it's just like, Hey, there's, there's somebody evil in there. And there's like an angel that's hanging around like, Nope, not today. Right. And like punching that demon in the throat. Like that fight is happening everywhere all the time. Yep. And, and the, the manifestations of that we see in our world are just outward manifestations of that invisible war. Everything is. And the faster we learn that, the faster what we see on Facebook, the faster what we hear from people in our life makes sense. Mm -hmm. When you're like, where did that come from? Why would they say that? Why would they do that? Well, because there's a battle they're unarmed for. There's a battle that they're fighting without anything and they're losing it. Right. Just like you and I do when we treat it the same way. Well, and we've talked a lot about how, you know, we, we are sinful people that by the choice that was made in the garden by Adam and Eve, sin entered the world. And with sin entered these demons, the, you know, Satan's forces of evil. Um, to me, that makes sense. Like, oh, you know, sin and Satan, they kind of all go together. Yeah. So, yeah, Absolutely. Well, that was three verses. So, uh, but I, I had a hunch <laughs> we would we would stop right there, uh, which is good. I mean, as you can see, it's hard. It's th these are difficult conversations to have in bigger settings because, like, it's weird. You know, so you're like, how do I how do I explain this to someone that has like no faith construct? It means you got to slow down and you need to give hopefully you a chance to ask questions. Thank you for doing that today. Um, and be able to break it down piece by piece and understand like, cause here's what I think, here's what I think is true. I think even, even non-Christians, um, one of the reasons that we see such a spike in not atheism, actually atheism is not what, like when you get into the nun category that exists in the world, it's the fastest growing, not N U N living in a convent, N O N E people that are non-religiously affiliated. When you actually get into those details, there's atheists. That's like, I don't believe God exists. And then there's agnostics, which is like, God is a thing. I don't really know that we're going to know anything about it. The, the reason that there are so many more agnostics is because what Paul talks about in Romans one is true, right? This, this idea of a spiritual realm, this idea of God's created ability like it's self-evident that you can't like look around and live in this world and be like, Oh, it's definitely all physical. Definitely a result of just random chance. Like at some point, I think it is self-evident that you look around and go, maybe I don't know it all. Maybe I'm not sure. I'm not bought into this idea or that construct of it, but like there's more than me here. And um, I think that's a good place to start. All right. So uh, if you're watching this and you have, prayer requests, things that, that we can be praying for you about, just like Jeanette shared, just, just drop those in the comments and I'll put them here. People actually pray for these even after we're done off of our time each day. So I uh, would love to include that there as well as anything you're thinking about in terms of application. So uh, today we kind of talked about the overall idea of the battle. Tomorrow we're going to talk about the specific aspects of armor. Um, but as you think about that, just drop in kind of how you are uh, considering uh, applying it. Uh, Dom said, this is so important to know because we don't prepare and defend ourselves against things we don't know about. Um, uh, uh, kind of like the red pill, blue pill matrix moment. Yeah. I loved when the matrix was a relevant movie because it was exactly this, right? It was like, <laughs> oh, we're, in, we're all in the matrix. Like we don't know it. And now you say it and people are like, what, what are you talking about? I don't know. So uh, and then Sherry says, my grandson wears uh, a t-shirt says not today, Satan. Yeah. That's Dylan. I think that wears yep, that shirt. Yep. That's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> so good. So good. Yep. All right, ma'am. So how are you thinking about applying what we've been reading and thinking about this? morning? Yeah, I think I'm just going to continue to reflect on that first uh, phrase, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Um, I used words like remember who you are and whose you are. Um, and then be before do, um, this idea that sometimes we're going to have to sit in something for a little bit before we're ready, uh, to put on this armor before we're ready to jump in the fight. Now, the thing is, uh, that doesn't mean the fight stops. 
It just means we need to, we need to take the time to prepare and be prepared before we jump in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, for me, we're not into it yet. We'll look at it tomorrow, but I think for me, it's, uh, it, uh, are there gaps in my spiritual preparation for each day? Yeah. Uh, Cause there are definitely things that when we look at the armor of God that are like pretty, like pretty built in for me. Like I've been doing it for lots of years and it's easy and it's a part of my routine and I get it. But then there are parts that are like, man, I'm not sure I'm thinking about that as much. I'm not sure I'm doing that as much. And Paul will show how like kind of each one of these pieces of armor that we have as a resource from God is protecting some kind of critical infrastructure. And it's this bigger metaphor, right? So it's not like my brain specifically, it's my mind. It's not my heart specifically. It's kind of within his construct of a Hebrew thinker. Your heart was the decision-making center of your life, right? It's it's your priorities. It's what you're loyal to. And so uh, I think figuring that stuff out will be really, really important. Uh, Dom has one here. He says, mm-hmm. uh, where in my life do I see evidence of the battle? Uh, what am I doing about it? Am I blowing through the tripwires? That is a great question. Um, yep. Because I do, I think it's easy for us to kind of just go like, Ah, I think I'm fine today. And, and if, if we're not seeing the battle today, it's not because it doesn't exist. Right. It's because we're not looking for it. Right. And if you haven't been looking for it in a long time, I'll just be honest with you. It can be really scary. It can be really hard. You can have conversations like Jeanette is talking about having with her neighbor. You're like, I didn't even know this stuff existed, but it's because there was this subtle thing that happens in a naturalistic structure. Like we live in the West where we're like, Oh, spiritual realm stuff. Yeah. That's weirdo. Like you need to take a pill for that. Right. And so being able to go like, no, 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 that's happening all around us. And it doesn't, it doesn't uh, negate the need for medicine or doctors or help, but it's to recognize that everything, everything is a spiritual problem. It might also be a f- physical problem or physiological problem or psychological problem, but everything is a spiritual problem. Yeah. Uh, Eileen said, it seems uh, to me, one of the best strategies of the devil is to downplay the spiritual war and convince people he doesn't exist so we don't fight back. I love that we were talking about this because I don't hear this talked about that much overall in the church. Uh, we need to suit up. And I, and I think, it, right, it's a hard conversation to know kind of like what are the appropriate venues. We talked about it this last weekend, but it's hard mm-hmm. to know what are the appropriate venues to have this conversation. Um, I, I think one of the things I've said for years, because people will ask me like, you know, I have buddies that are, are missionaries, men and women around the world, uh, and they'll tell me stuff that's like, just unthinkable stuff like we read in the Bible, right? Like, Oh, there, there's a demon possessed person and like God saved them. And they're in a totally different spot now. Um, and, and like people had known them their entire life and it just was like a switch got flipped. Um, and I, and they asked me like, why don't you think that happens in America? And my response, uh, I feel like is, is exactly what you're saying. Eileen. like, mm-hmm. I think, I think Satan's like, that would actually be counter to my strategy. Like if I did crazy stuff, people would be like, uh, I think there might be something to this. Right. I think the idea that it all looks like he doesn't exist is absolutely by design. Well, and I think it goes back to that idea of knowledge and knowing about something and then actually knowing somebody or something. And so uh, we're in that tension right now of we want to know about something. But what Paul is saying is that you actually have to know this. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, and then Crystal said, uh, prayer request uh, for Lisa in the communication class starting tonight. Look at that. And that, uh, my family, uh, to be open to vulnerability, uh, that this opportunity brings us closer together. We'll be praying for that class. That's awesome. Um, and then Leslie has a idea she, or a, a application question. She says, am I allowing Satan to influence my, uh, me negatively through gossip, temptations, selfishness, etc." Yeah, that's a hard question. Um, and, and I think, more of us as Christians should ask it. Right. I, I agree a thousand, a thousand percent because we think we're the exception. Mm-hmm. That's what the devil wants us to think. And that's why Paul cautions us throughout his letters to guard our hearts and to guard our minds. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Ooh, this is good. Dom says, uh, seems like his strategy in the U.S. is stealth cloaked in a cover of busyness. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons that people are kind of freaking out right now is that we've stripped out a lot of busyness. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, uh, what's left? Yeah. What's sitting underneath that? Well, and that's what Jenny Allen addresses in that, um, 
it's not a poem, but in that article or whatever it is that she wrote. So, it, you know, take time to read it because it's very interesting. It starts off with like these really big attacks and then it becomes very, very um, almost unseen and, and unknown, just yeah. a part of our daily rhythm and routine where it's just this distraction of busy. Did you already drop that somewhere? I did. Yeah. I put it up at the top underneath uh, screw tape letters. Oh, nice. Perfect. There it is. Awesome. Um, and then uh, Becky said, Satan preys on our weaknesses. I think he gets more bang for his evil buck uh, by pitting us against one another. And that's like the best, I mean, that's the best attack, right? Like if he can get us fighting each other, we're doing the damage and he just kind of steps back, you know? Yeah. And the whole time God is like, please stop, please stop. Mm -hmm. Like I'm literally telling you, this is how it works and you yeah. keep doing it. Yeah. Stop doing it. Don't, and like, here's a great, in my opinion, here is a great identifier. If you, if you being right allows you in your own mind to compromise how you show up in that relationship, you're not right. Hmm. You're not right. Yeah. So I've just watched it so many times that people take like, here's the position that I have that's right. Here's the thing that is correct. Here's the thing that you did that's wrong. And so now I get to justify my bad behavior in the way I show up to this conflict because I'm morally correct or better than you in some other area. And you're like, no, no, that. That's not the way that how we show up is, 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 is as important to what we show up with. Yeah. And that's why Paul spends so much time talking about it. Yep. Is um, proving your point matter more than the people that you're. Yeah. I mean, we, we say, we say to our kids all the time, yeah. being right is not worth the relationship. Yeah. But for some reason we outgrow that lesson. Uh, Liz says, I agree, especially right now with the division that we are seeing. Yeah. I mean, we are living in a time, pick a space. We are so crazy divided. Is it any wonder why the centerpiece of the church, the centerpiece of the body that God talks about is unity? Hmm. Amazing. So, yeah. well, guys, this has been such a great conversation. I have absolutely loved hanging out with you um, this morning. We will kind of dive into the armor of God section tomorrow. We're going to pray in just a minute. Um, but just want to kind of remind you guys, we have some links up here. We'll kind of break down the uh, specific aspects of the armor of God tomorrow. If you've never done that, um, it could be really life changing for you. But understanding um, understanding the stakes is is really really important. So, um, and man, we're we're like doing prayer requests and everything today. Hold on, let me drop this one in here. Um, there we go. That's awesome. So Leslie's asking us this prayer request. She says, prayer request for my brother, Richard. We're waiting to get his COVID results. He may have been exposed at work. We're praying because my sister-in-law is pregnant and due next Monday. Oh my gosh. Our parents live with them and they're both in their seventies. We'll actually be, we'll absolutely be praying for your, for your brother. Uh, wow. All right. Well, let me pray for us. I'll pray for these requests specifically. They'll continue to live on here. And then tomorrow at 8 a.m. We will start with verse 13. God, thanks for today. Uh, thanks for the ways that we're able to, um, God, be able to, thanks to your revelation, look into what's happening that we can't see. And it takes faith, God. It takes faith to believe it. It takes faith not to discard it. Uh, but I think God, we feel it. We sense it, that there's more going on than what we can see. And so today, whether that's our frustration or our discouragement or our disappointment, um, God, would you show up? Would you give us encouragement today? Uh, I pray for the specific areas of request that we have um, specifically right now. We pray for um, Jeanette's neighbor, Charlie. Uh, and the, I mean, I, I can't imagine what's going on in his heart, God, and how much of this is, um, you know, in his mind, how much of it is physiological, but we know everything's spiritual, God. So we pray healing over him. God, we pray for his mind today. We pray that you would give him peace. Mm -hmm. We pray, God, that if there is... Um, uh, evil influence, if there is uh, a demon tormenting him, God, that you would send your angels uh, to his side to give him hope, to give him healing, to give him a future. God, we pray uh, for this class that Lisa and Anthony are going to get started with um, and pray for the folks that are going to be in it, including Crystal and her family, that it would be really helpful and healthy in this time, God, where I think some of our challenges um, inside of family relationships and communication have been exposed because we're around each other so much more. Would you use that as an opportunity uh, to dig in, to be able to get through what it is folks are facing? And God, we pray for uh, Leslie's brother, Richard, uh, that the results of this COVID test would come back and that they would be negative. And God, that um, his the, the aging parents that live with them would be protected, that um, her, her sister-in-law who's pregnant, God, that she would be healthy, that you know all the things, whatever hospital they're in, that they need to 
um, preserve in order to be together. God, that they'd be able to do that. That is scary for any of us, but certainly in those circumstances, that feels overwhelming. God, we pray for the rest of our day that this would not be our only time with you, um, but this would just really, God, set our day to be able to spend it uh, with you. I pray that we would show up to meetings. And even if other people in that meeting don't know that they're in a spiritual battle, we would know. And that we, God, just like Paul tells us about, we would be doing battle for them. We would be praying. We, God, would be interceding for them, even in that meeting, even in that circumstance for them, for the battle they might not even know they're in yet. And God, as we prepare to talk about the armor of God and how we show up with it tomorrow, would you prepare our minds and our hearts to change, to reflect how you've created them to be? God, we love you. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, and just a reminder, for Aurora Marketplace will be happening again tomorrow. Uh, there's donation lists that are on my Facebook page and Eastern Hills Facebook page uh, to drop stuff off. We gave a bunch, away a whole bunch of stuff. I dropped off a couple bags that Alyssa put things in yesterday. I think they were the right things. Alyssa did it, so they were. <laughs> uh, so there's, there's uh, baskets right in front of church. If you need help, know someone who needs help or want to help, check out uh, for Aurora on any of the platforms or email forroar at ehills.org. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great day.